In the summer of 1975, the Land of Oz amusement park was doing pretty well for itself. Tucked away on Beach Mountain in North Carolina, the Wizard of Oz themed attraction turned a nice little profit while entertaining over 120,000 guests. Yet just a few months later, the park would be forced to close before being ransacked and set on fire. It was no tornado, but it was still a pretty rough time for Oz. In the late 1960s, Grover and Harry Robbins were looking to expand their business on Beach Mountain in a large way. The two brothers, who ran the Carolina Caribbean Corp, had a ski resort on the mountain. The problem was that skiing was a winter activity, and that meant there was a whole lot of nothing going on during the summer months. But if the mountain was supplemented with a summer resort, vacation homes, and an amusement that could run nearly all year long, that problem wouldn't be much of a problem anymore. Yet, they didn't want to compromise the beauty of the natural surroundings that the mountain offered. So they decided whatever they built up there would have to work with nature rather than against it. They turned to local designer Jack Pentis to try and find the delicate balance they were looking for. While visiting the land on top of Beach Mountain, he was inspired by the gnarled, twisted trees that grew under windy conditions. It was there that he envisioned the space as the Land of Oz from L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz. So with a rumored budget of between two and three million dollars, Pentis set out to bring the Land of Oz to life. The attraction itself was less of an amusement park and more of an immersive walkthrough experience that told the story of the Wizard of Oz. At a price of $3 for adults and $2 for children, guests would arrive at Land of Oz either by gondola or bus. They would first experience a small museum dedicated to the story, as well as the MGM film. From there, guided groups of around 20 people would be taken on a tour that started at Dorothy's farm in Kansas. Just like the film, the farm is soon threatened by a storm, and the guests are quickly ushered into an underground cellar. It's there that audio and visual effects would be used to simulate a tornado hitting the farm. After the storm passed, the guests would then be let out through a different exit where they would discover the damaged farmhouse, which happened to be sitting on the Wicked Witch. That's also where they would find the famous Yellow Brick Road, and their journey through Oz would begin. The 1,375-foot road was comprised of over 40,000 yellow bricks, and along the pathway, guests would come across the different houses of the famous Wizard of Oz characters, along with a mixture of the mountain's natural surroundings and handcrafted bizarre flora. Just like the movie, the Yellow Brick Road would then bring guests to the Emerald City, albeit a smaller one. There, they were treated to a 30-minute stage show, also called Land of Oz, that filled out the story and saw the Scarecrow seeking his brain, the Cowardly Lion his courage, and the Tin Man his heart. It featured mostly original songs, and only borrowed from the film when it came to Over the Rainbow. At the end of the story, they'd watch Dorothy depart Oz via a hot air balloon that wasn't actually a hot air balloon. In actuality, it was the park's only ride. It was essentially a system of 28 modified ski lifts that were disguised to look like small hot air balloons, and it would give guests riding it scenic views of Beach Mountain. The visitors would also be able to visit the Toadstool restaurant for lunch, or a cheese shop called the Mouse House. Finally, looping back around to the farm, guests would get to enjoy a petting zoo before leaving for the day. Groundbreaking occurred in the summer of 1969 with a small ceremony that was attended by actor Ray Bulger, who played the role of the Scarecrow in the film. The construction of Land of Oz took a year, and was built with the original goal of preserving as much of the natural surroundings as possible. So the placement of the Yellow Brick Road, as well as the characters' homes, was largely dictated by where they could find natural clearings. Only underbrush was cleared for construction, and by the time the park was ready to open in the summer of 1970, only one single tree over six inches in height had been cut down for space. In order to fill out the museum, the Carolina Caribbean Corp recruited the help of actress Debbie Reynolds to help secure Wizard of Oz costumes and props at an MGM auction. Reynolds, herself, was collecting Hollywood memorabilia for her Hollywood Hall of Fame. Together, they were able to win the Wicked Witch's hat, the Cowardly Lion costume, the Wizard's wagon, and some Munchkin costumes. Their prized possession, however, was Dorothy's blue and white dress. Land of Oz opened to the public on June 15, 1970, and the following month, on July 2nd, a formal ceremony was held for the park, 
with Debbie Reynolds attending to help cut the ribbon. Joining her on the trip was her 13-year-old daughter, Carrie Fisher. Looking out for Fisher's privacy, Reynolds requested that the press didn't take any photos of her daughter, claiming that, quote, she'll have her day. The park was initially a hit. Well, it was as much of a hit as a walk-through immersive park in the mountains could expect to be. Its first month of operation brought in 95,000 visitors, and its first season topped off at just over 301,000 visitors. It wasn't Disneyland or anything, but it wasn't trying to be either. It brought in modest revenues that put the park on the path of profitability. And more importantly, it kept people coming to Beach Mountain even when the slopes were closed. The following year was even better, and the estimated total attendance by the end of 1971 was 800,000. Land of Oz served as an example of how a unique idea with a modest budget could thrive. Unfortunately, it also served as an example of how thriving sometimes doesn't matter when you're a small cog in a larger machine. In early 1975, after a number of successful summers for Land of Oz, Tri-South Mortgage Investors of Atlanta filed a notice of foreclosure on all of Carolina Caribbean Corp's equipment and land, including the park. They claimed they were owed $2.75 million by CCC. At nearly the same time, Northwestern Bank filed a repossession notice on all vehicles and furniture, also citing unpaid debts. So that February, in a desperate defensive move, the Carolina Caribbean Corp filed for Chapter 10 bankruptcy. The company cited a string of warmer-than-usual winters that impacted their skiing seasons, which was still the bread and butter of their business. On top of that, they blamed the general economic downturn of the early 70s for a decline in lot sales when it came to the thousands of homes they were trying to build. By filing for Chapter 10, they were hoping the court would appoint a trustee to oversee the reorganization and block the foreclosures and repossessions. And that's exactly what happened. However, once the court-appointed trustees started to work on the reorganization, it became very clear that CCC was only telling half of the story. Yes, the bad winters and decline in sales did hurt their financials, but they also had a record of poor cash management, and it was revealed that they had not filed their taxes or anything with the SEC for the previous two years. With everything tallied up, they were burdened with $20 million in long-term debt, and they were doing a poor job of handling what little money was coming their way. The restructuring did allow Land of Oz to open that summer, but by September, all of the company's operations were ordered to be shut down for two weeks while the company sought additional funding. Tragically, Land of Oz was a victim in all of this. The attraction on its own was actually profitable that year, bringing in $90,000 with a season of 120,000 guests. That winter, as the fate of Land of Oz was up in the air, things went from bad to worse. Just days after Christmas, on December 28th, Land of Oz was broken into. The museum portion of the park was cleared out, with some of the costumes and props being stolen, including Dorothy's dress. Adding insult to injury, the Emerald City Amphitheater and Connecting Gift Shop were set on fire and burned to the ground. A $500 reward was placed on the return of the dress, but it was ultimately never recovered. But just like an overused phoenix metaphor, a new land of Oz rose from the ashes. Uh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Yes, sir. So we'd like you to keep your promise to us, if you please, sir. The following March, Land of Oz, along with Beech Tree Village and various other aspects of Beach Mountain's resort, were awarded to Tri-South Mortgage as a way of paying off the debt. Tri-South quickly announced that they would be investing $500,000 in the repair and revitalization of Land of Oz so that it could be open that spring. It was a smart decision, since the park was one of the few parts of the mountain that was consistently profitable. A replica dress was put into the museum, and a new Emerald City was constructed just in time for the 1976 summer season. Over the following few years, the park's attendance did decline. An amusement that had premiered in 1970 with 300,000 guests was finishing out the decade with well under 100,000. Many attributed the slump to the rise in popularity of other amusements, like Carowinds, and even other East Coast options further away, like Disney World. Others pointed to the 1979 oil crisis as a cause. Undoubtedly, the decline in popularity of The Wizard of Oz had to have also played a role. The film by that point was nearly 40 years old, 
and new younger generations were introduced to films like Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And yeah, that doesn't mean that older films can't still be appreciated. I mean, there are plenty of rides at Disney today that are based on films over 40 years old, and they're still popular. However, when the entire park is anchored in that one film, it becomes an uphill battle. Suddenly, for the park to thrive, that one film needs to remain relevant. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case for Land of Oz, and so in 1980, the park closed its doors for the final time. But like an overused phoenix metaphor that was used two times too many, a new Land of Oz would rise from the ashes. Again. Kind of. The park would remain closed to the public for well over a decade, becoming a popular spot for urban explorers looking to check out that weird Wizard of Oz park on the mountain. The ownership of the land would change hands, and while the park remained untouched, the surrounding areas would be developed into housing. In 1991, an employee hired to help sell that housing moved into an apartment built into Uncle Henry's barn, and over the years slowly restored parts of Land of Oz. In 1999, the park was reopened for a special reunion event for past employees of the park, and that event would eventually lead to the annualized reopening of Land of Oz. It proved that while the demand for the park had moved on from being a daily summer attraction, there was still enough interest to justify opening it for a few weekends every year. Every fall, the park is reopened on the weekends for an Autumn of Oz festival, where the public can once again walk along the yellow brick road. Was Land of Oz a failure? I think the answer is that it both was and wasn't. It was a park born out of the idea of creating a peripheral business that would help carry the weight of a bunch of other seasonal businesses. And by that measure, it was a failure. It was fated to be. How could a modest-sized park based on an aging film, albeit a classic film, ever do well enough to fulfill that destiny? Yet at the same time, it was a creative success. It's unique and memorable, and it was a place that was visited by millions and loved by just as many. Sure, it took decades to find its rhythm, but today it survives because it's a park that knows what it is and doesn't try to be something it isn't. It's not aiming for hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. It's not trying to fill parking lots every day of the summer. It's free from those initial burdens that were arguably impossible to carry. It's a park that always had what it truly needed. It just took a long journey to find that out. Pretty. And your little dog, too! 